in what way can I persuade you to do some change in your life and to go and find something that you lost or deny or abandoned or didn't take care of enough? Thank you for joining us, BT. We are very lucky to be here on the Shalom Harpen campus, together with the wonderful scholars. We already chatted with a few of your very fine colleagues and friends, and we hope to have an open conversation, see where it goes. We'll go through the history and the mysteries of Jewish mysticism, see what they mean to yourself, a scholar in the field, and to everyday, ordinary people like myself. And um, hopefully it'll be a fun and exciting conversation. So, Bitti, you've done work both on Rabbi Nachman of Breslov and on the Tikkuni Zohar. Those are, if I can say, some of the, like, the two main poles of your scholarship. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I also, I'm also interested in uh, Kabbalah in Tzvat in the 16th century, in, you know, in Agon Vilna, in Rav Kook. But yeah, yes, we can say so. Yeah. So, so a lot of diverse but related thinkers and, and trains of thought. I'm, I'm curious, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you have some insight on this. Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Nachman ben Fega, is having a real revival today in Israel here and around the world in a, a new sense of Jewish spirituality and meaning. And I'm, very, I'm always curious to see when things are working spiritually, what is it that's making them tick? And I was wondering if you, as a scholar of Rabbi Nachman, had an insight into what it is in his Torah and his teaching that is really resonating with the public today in 2022, some 150, 200 years since his passing. Even more, yeah, more than 200. Um, um, you know, in Israel, it's a big thing. Breslav is a very big thing. Uh, uh, first of all, it's the, it's the biggest uh, movement of people coming to religion, Chazarah B'Tshuva, and um, it's very interesting because usually Hasidut, Hasidis is very close communities and for Breslav everyone is welcome. Uh, secondly, it's, 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 we can see it in, in, you know, in, in, um, in books, in theater, in songs, in, in Israeli songs, you know, that you can take a piece of Rab Nachman text and, and make it into a tune and people are singing it on a radio and um, film and movies and it's really permeating the culture it's, it's very it's very present mm -hmm. in the israeli uh, you know um space and also in religious places you know it comes up that people are making chavruta on rav nachman sitting and studying the main book of likutei moharan and I, I can say that breslav is 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 all over is all over uh, the israeli um I don't know, Israeli uh, Havaya, you know, the Israeli, Israeli experience. experience. Yeah, it's very, it's very strong. So, you know, even though it's strong outside, each of us made his own way into uh, Breslav. I can say that uh, I was, I was shocked by, by the stories first when I read it and then for, for the Torah, which is actually homilies that Rab Nachman is writing. And I think that uh, he is the one, like, you know, Watson and Sherlock Holmes. So Sherlock Holmes is saying, you know, in a few kilometers from here, there will be a Niagara Falls. And Watson say, how do you know that? And he said, I can feel in the air, there's a few drops of water mm -hmm. coming. So I think Abnachman Nachman was a kind of a person that saw where uh, Jewish life is going to be, like what is going to be, everything is going to collapse. Mm -hmm. I mean, the traditional, you know, the traditional uh, ghetto, uh, strong, uh, close communities of religion uh, will collapse. And he actually in his life saw the beginning of it. Enlightenment will come, secularization, secularism uh, will come. And there, there wasn't, there was no way that Jewish style, lifestyle will remain mm. as it is. So I think he actually um, um, put in words uh, something that he felt deep inside, uh, that something is going to change and irreversible. It wasn't, it wouldn't be the same as it was. And I think he actually uh, offers us a way of uh, emunah, faith and religious life that is very interwave into the doubt and to uncertainty 
and to the fact that he actually acknowledged that science and rational thinking is not the way you can you can deal with faith. Mm. He said you cannot you know smell a flower with your ear. It's not the right way. It's not the right tool to get into faith. That faith needs needs a new nisuach, a new um, a new expression mm. in nowadays. Mm. Uh, pulling it aside from science, pulling it aside from rational thinking from uh, also Jewish philosophers like Maimonides, for mm. example, that he he um, was against. There's, there's no love lost between them. No, not really. <laughs> not really, even though he read everything. Right. But he, he realized that to say that faith is something that you need to know and you need to acknowledge in your, in your understanding and your cognitive uh, tools, it's not the right way. Mm. And that actually... A faith is not a, a, a static thing, but rather a process hmm. that that actually uh, offers you, demands from you, work, ongoing work, a process, a life process, and that faith is coming with doubt, hmm. and that uh, as we say, the the empty, the void space from God actually has, in a certain way, God's within it. Uh, and and that Moses, which is the ideal man, uh, actually a very well-known uh, text of uh, Breslav is saying that taking the verse that you know in the biggest revelation uh, description in in the Bible of of you know the the Jewish people getting uh, to know God and getting the the Torah. Uh, was was a, 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 a scene that actually was including in itself, inside, a foggy element. Mm. And it says that actually the people of Israel said to Moses, we are going, we are going to step back, uh, we can't deal with it. And actually the verse is saying that Moses approached the, approached the, fro the fog uh, because there was God. Mm. So, you know, in, in, the, in the first level we can say that the mountain, the Sinai mountain was full of foggy and therefore Moshe entered the fog. It's a geographical a description. But Rabbi Nachman is saying, no, this is uh, actually existential uh, archetype of religious experience, which is there is a fog, there is uncertainty, there is a vague place and you need to deal with it. You need to go inside foggy, the foggy and and to um to create yourself the experience of god you've opened up a whole can of <laughs> themes here and i want to um take some time to like slowly unpack them one by one if you'll allow me so you're saying that rabbi nachman is very much on the collective mind and heart of the jewish people globally and particularly here in israel and you're saying that something has to do with his foreseeing the collapse of faith in the traditional sense and his reinterpretation of faith as a new model as as a, a way of life as a struggling with doubt um, against the position of like a Maimonidean or you know Aristotelian like firm like we know these things because they're true um, I'm curious I, I want to open up that theme but I'm curious I heard you mention briefly about your own journey into Reb Nachman as a thinker and as a as a religious guide perhaps I'm curious to know a bit about as much as you feel comfortable sharing about your own story into Rabbi Nachman, into mm. the Kote Maharan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I um, grew up in a, grew up in a family that actually both of my parents uh, made uh, opposite way. My father started in a secular family and became Choser B'Tshuva and became into religious uh, in his twentieth. And my mom did the opposite direction. She started from a very religious family and she did the, the other direction. Both of my parents were a part of a group of people uh, that Rabbi Steinsatz, the very famous one that uh, created the, you know, the new Talmud setting uh, that was since then translated into many, many languages. Uh, they created Rabbi a group Adin of Steinsatz. people. Uh, Rabbi Adin Steinsatz. Yeah. Yeah, they created a kind of a group of people very intellectual, uh, academic, science, science people, art, therapy, um, 
people that uh, wanted to explore their life and uh, they were they were meeting uh, they were meeting a few times a week I mean studying Talmud but then also uh, every every week Saturday night they were meeting this group of people and studying together speaking about life and studying together usually it was Hasidut or something that has to do I was very little and I was you know sleeping in my bed mm -hmm. but um, I keep remember remembering the the sounds of the people these meetings uh, were happening in your house in, sometimes they were you know rotating rotating gotcha. in a people's house but uh, just to know that people decided not to go to a film or something right. or just to meet and to study something um, made me understand that there's something very beautiful and right. rich so they were exploring these sort of existential themes and questions through the text of Judaism yeah they were talking about it in a very critical way mm -hmm. not that you know Rab Adin Steinas was Adin and there were a group of people that they were exploring their way into Jewish life in a very critical and um, sincere I would say and profound way and I, I thought to myself wow it must be very interesting so I think it really it made my way and from the other side you know um, my mom kept uh, challenging me she's mm. a she was a very well-known psychoanalyst uh, in Jerusalem and also New York but uh, she kept challenging me about you know this kind of Freudian critical thinking about religion uh, do you need uh, you know you need a figure of, of, of a, a father that he will tell you what to do right. this kind you know this kind of things or everything is sublimation of, of sex and there was a, there was a lot of challenging uh, around the topic of religion uh, in my home and I think it uh, really um, challenged me and created uh, a lot of interest and curiosity about those those things so well fascinating so you're saying you fell asleep many nights to this <laughs> critical discussion of of jewish themes religious themes um and that your mother who herself came from a religious background didn't let you accept religiosity as a naive belief but would right. challenge you with <laughs> freud right. and with god knows what yeah um that's fascinating did you i'm just curious did you have a personal relationship with Rav Steinsaltz as you matured yeah yeah i i did yes uh, we grew up together so i was like it was a group actually they decided about creating a kind of settlement mm. very interestingly they called it shalhevet which is a flame it's a kind of uh, their i think their understanding of jewish life as something that needs to be fire in your heart and not something that is uh, has to do with the bourgeois mm. way of living or I would say you know this kind of uh, obeying rules but rather something that say you say fire you sure. something that is meaning meaning in a in a very deep uh, sense to it and so they wanted to make an actual lives community that was they were pursuing. they were thinking about it but yeah. because they were all I mean everyone was busy with his own career right and they were they weren't such i would say you know um very practical people <laughs> uh, it fell down but they really wanted to create a kind of a they wanted also to influence the society in mm -hmm. israel and to create a kind of a, a sincere talking about uh, jewish ideas i think rabbi stein that's made made is like you know tons of of books in a very, um, I would say, accessible way to people around the world. Uh, but anyone, anyone, every one of this group uh, contribute hmm. uh, to this kind of, of idea. Uh, you know, to wake up in a Shabbat afternoon, Saturday afternoon, it's a, it's a holy day, and to see my dad sitting and studying and, and um, this kind of... Um, eating together in uh, meals and uh, singing a Kabbalist song of uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Luria um, and talking about those ideas um, created I would say who I am hmm. yeah fascinating I think it was also very very part of it that uh, you should you should you should live it meaning in, in I would say in the Hasidic way that God is not transcendent to the world, that uh, God is uh, actually within everything you do, with the way you talk to your kids, with the way you create the society around you, 
with art, with the body, nothing is alienating uh, you uh, from, from God. Right, Life, nothing, nothing alienates you from God. Everything is part of that. As everything is right. part of that. Right. Everything. And these are values that you carried into your own family, into your own home. Yeah, I'm trying. You're yeah. trying. Okay, so let's let's come back to the to the character that we started with. What was Rabbi Nachman's place at that table of critical Jewish existential Steinzaltian discourse? I don't know about Breslov in that days. I mean, I'm speaking about uh, my my parents' days. I think Chabad was very on the table, but but also Baal Shem Tov. Personally, Breslov, I felt that it uh, resonates to uh, things that I was thinking about. Uh, that faith is not something that you can actually explain. You know, the Hasidic uh, text is saying that uh, it's like a taste in your mouth. Mm. Uh, you know, the word tam in Hebrew mm. has a double meaning. It's also a reason, but it's mm. also a taste. Mm. So there's a pasuk in, in Psalm, Ta'amu u'uki tov Hashem, taste and uh, see that God is, is great. Uh, but the Hasidic text saying taste in your mouth, you cannot express to your, your, your fellow. It's something that is, is um, always private. I mean, not the Jewish life is private. It's very public. You go three times a day and you are in a community. But rather it always go through you. It's a, actually, it's a, it's a personal experience and, and uh, transformation that uh, even though it happens outside maybe, if it doesn't touch you, it doesn't touch you. Mm. So it also needs to be by yourself. And I think Rav Nachman is somebody like this. First of all, exposing all his way uh, coming to be Rav Nachman, you know, a, a writing a kind of a biography, a very, a, how do you say, Hosfani, exposed biography. Not very uh, flattering, I must, I must say, to, to a rabbi, you know, in his, uh, mm. in his uh, saying that he has, he had um, a kind of a crave for food and sex and if, uh, lots of failure and feeling that God is far away from him. All this kind of uh, creating a kind of, uh, I would say, um, negative CV, you know, mm. the saying, uh, I'm in a process, I'm doing a process that uh, being in contact with God, it's not a decision that you, once decision that you make, you made a V, yeah, I know God exists and therefore, but it's a kind of a ongoing process that you grow with it and you transfer yourself with it and this is transformation makes you, it's a kind of an ongoing process and Rav Nachman actually saying, I wouldn't want myself, if I would find myself today in the stage that I was yesterday. Mm. So to say it's a kind of a, it's a kind of a trying to um, to uplift yourself and to improve yourself and to tune yourself. Uh, I think uh, made a very impact on me. Not to say that you know faith is a kind of a truth or false decision, but rather an ongoing and that you're very um, you're very present in mm. it. You need to you need to make your way. You need to you create it actually. Mm. Um, so we have we have this character that you're you're opening up, you're fleshing out for us, you're bringing him to life, of a very vulnerable, a very honest someone struggling with their own challenges, their own doubt, their own temptation as a religious character, um, something perhaps I don't know if this if we're allowed to make comparisons, but something like um, Augustine in his Confessions writing about his own, and really pushing for a first-hand experiential relationship with God. Something like the Muslims might call, I think it's Dawk, which is like to taste God. Tamur Kitev Hashem, as King David writes. How does Rabbi Nachman um, guide or teach his reader to come and taste God? What is the what is the methodology? What is the path to tasting God? Very interesting uh, question. I would say that you know, first of all, to say. He's saying to his uh, disciples, I will, I will lead you to a new path. Although it's a very old one, no one stepped on it. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of, ref as my, my teacher, Professor Yudalibis, uh, described it once, it's a kind of a reform, not reform into, <laughs> you know, it's a reform to say, you know, I will lead you to a new way, to a new path. Uh, it's it's anti-traditional in its essence. But nevertheless, to say, I'm bringing you to a new place 
um, eh, or saying about himself, I'm so young, but rather I'm so old. Eh, and I'm a chidush. I myself, I'm, I'm a novation. Um, I think it's a kind of a guiding line to his disciples and to us to say, you need all the time to uh, come up with a new thing, with a chidush. Uh, it's like, you know, it's In like innovation. innovation. Mm. Yeah, innovation way to think about yourself, to create yourself a way, way of God. Another thing is a uh, is to um to not to not allow our religious lives to remain static. To, you know, you to cannot be satisfied you can, with the status quo. Right, you cannot remain static. Um, another way is um is uh, involving the body. Mm. I think he creates a very psychophysic uh, way of thinking about religion as something that uh, involves the body. For example, if you have a, a kushia, if you have a doubt, a question about God, you should scream. Uh, he creates a new, actually a new, uh, I would say, a new uh, ritual in the Jewish tradition to go outside to the field and to daven. To leave, you know, to leave the, uh, the prey house, the shul, and to go to the woods. Uh, we can imagine it in U Ukraine in his time, in the 18th century, but uh, also for today. I mean, we sitting now in Jerusalem, you know, far away from here, not far away from here, uh, there is a wood. Yar uh, Yerushalayim, the Jerusalem forest. There's not a lot of woods in, in Israel, but people are going there. We mm. can go there now and see that people actually attached, you know, um, chairs to the to the chunk of the, the tree, the tree uh, for, for their coming in the night and screaming and, as Rabbi Nachman puts it, is speaking to God as one speak to his friend. Mm. Um, uh, there's a woods for women and for men. I mean, <laughs> this kind of ritual to say uh, you should uh, relate to God not as a transcendent and not to uh, just somebody is uh, above mm. you and not just as a king and not just as a ruler, but also to create a kind of uh, mutual mm. space for you to be with God. Uh, I think it's also a kind of a thing process. And of course, not to be a bourgeois. Jew. This, this is what he said, you know, he said uh, to be, uh, you know, a good in need, a, a good ye Jewish people. I know this is not what I wanted from you. He says, he says to his disciples, I want you to be like animals that roar in the woods uh, for, 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 for God's, you know, will presence or mm. So this kind of not uh, not feeling comfortable mm. in your religion area, but uh, trying to um, to use this space as a space for you to uh, to make yourself better, to make yourself uh, higher, to make yourself. Uh, this is kind of a place that I I actually identify that. Uh, that religion is is coming to your life. It's a part of of you, and you know, as one of the Hasidic uh, of Rabbi Nachman uh, uh, said, "God, where is God? God is where you let Him in." Mm. So, so we need to let God in in many many realms of our place, and I think also in a Hasidic way, uh, involving also physical things like mm. dancing, clapping hands, uh, shouting that I mentioned. Mm. It has this kind of understanding that that Rabbi Nachman described it in his own style of, of writing, that not just the soul telling the body, but also the body can tell mm. the soul, meaning mm. um, the situation that you in your five senses, maybe more, and, and your body, and your, your um, performance are actually uh, creating now a kind of a, of a spiritual moment and that it's not they are not alienated to each other not the body to the soul mm. not the soul to the body it's not that if uh, you uh, cut yourself from your body from your desires from your uh, sense of beauty from your uh, materialistic side you will be higher in the air no vice versa you should actually give a place to the soul to tell the body and also involve the body in telling the soul all kinds of things. So if you are praying, try to pray 
in, in your body. Mm. Try to be active, try to be, you know, a presence in, in, in senses, in the musical, in, the, uh, in your dancing, in your clapping hands. Actually, uh, you know, Professor Haviva Pedaya, that she's a scholar also, she, she spoke about two ways of Hasidism. One is the introvert, you know, taking uh, from sociology, one is the introvert and one is the extrovert. So the introvert actually saying we are worshiping God with silence, with nullifying our body and our presence and our ego and everything in order to let the divine presence in us. But there's also a different way, which is the extrovert, which meaning, which the meaning is that you actually enhance bodily expressions and the body presence in the spiritual mm. moments. Uh, so there's two ways. I mean, Hasidut, we can say the Magid of Meza, which is the introvert style, and, and Reb Nachman of Breslav, which is a grand-grand a son of the Baal Shem Tov, actually they took another style, which is the extrovert. And I think has to do with his, um, his attitude to the body. Um, that is also very present in his, uh, in his writing. What is his attitude to the body? You began to speak about him integrating the body into the service, but how, how would you describe his attitude? I would describe it, a, a, it's a well-known expression in Hasidut, Avodah Begashmiut, worshipping God with the material elements. A, if you smoke a cigarette and his grand-grandfather, Baal Shem Tov, has a, this kind of U U Ukraine pipes, a, which he saw, you know, the, the rings of the smoke is something that can uplift him, but actually he enjoyed the smoke, not to speak to today, but those days, yes. So it's a kind of worshiping God for them. Or if you, um, if you eat something and you enjoy the food or you enjoy the aesthetic of something, it's, it's part of it. Mm. Uh, don't cut, you know, don't uh, deny your own bodily existence and, and sides of life uh, from the spiritual uh, experience. Mm but rather try to actually inside it, you know, Nachmanides was the first one to say, you know, you go to the market and you, you put in a plastic bag tomatoes and you can speak with people, very simple people about all these technical things, how much does it cost and blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, your, your mind can be up. So this kind of trying to include a, these two elements of this concrete life, uh, joy, uh, bodily existence of us and of the world, and at the same time to to see the divine in it. Mm. Uh, this this kind of uh, and also, for example, Reb Nachman is saying there's all kinds of faith. By the way, it's interesting to say that there's all kinds of stages of faith. Not mm. that, as I said in the beginning, you decided that you believe in God. Okay, V, and that's it. But there's stages in faith. For example, he said somebody can have a faith in his brain. But the most, uh, the most important thing is that he will have uh, faith in all his limbs. This mm. is, I'm quoting, translating from, from Hebrew. Uh, so you need to have a faith also in your hands. If you're clapping hands uh, with the joy, mm. so the divine uh, presence now also in your hands and if you are dancing which was a very um prominent thing in the ritual of the hasidic uh, community so god now is in 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 your heels mm. and you can uplift your heel he will be upper so mm. try to i would say that you know the most important thing is to to live the divine in all its essence in a high extensive <laughs> A way mm. not to uh, not to be you know doing what you need to do or think that you need to do because you are supposed to do it but rather with with the joy and intensity intensity mm. um, empowering also the emotion you know for the Hasidic a, a, um, writing is about love and fear from God, uh, 
you know, you have to do every mitzvah, every commandment, every ritual that you do with love and fear. Mm. Otherwise, it won't uplift. It's a new idea. Like, you know, in the, in the Talmud, they won't say you have to do it with this and this. You should have to do it. You, you just have to do it. But to say you have to do it with love and fear and with joy and sometimes with cleaving, which is a dvikut, intensity, is a kind of a chidush uh, of, of intensifying. An innovation. Inten in, in innovation. It's intensifying uh, the religious life. And I think this is the, this is the new aspect of Hasidut understanding that uh, you should intensify your your work with God and for Nachman historical understanding it won't work if you do if you do what you have to do just because you it was written to you in the you know in the codex in the religious codex but you should intensify it you should feel it in with all in you uh, you should give it a place in all your existence size hmm. so what, what I'm hearing from you is that Rabbi Nachman is really a, a radical mystic in some sense. He's fighting against the status quo, against the bourgeoisie Jew who is fulfilling all of their obligations according to the letter of the law, the Shulchan Aruch, and therefore feels that they're doing their job. And he, he wants them, as you said, to be like wild animals yelling out to God in the, in the, in the middle of the night. I have, I have both like a, an embodied, right? Rabbi Nachman asks us to be embodied. And I have an embodied response and question, and then I have a bit more of a theoretical question. The, the embodied response is that I feel pretty bourgeoisie sitting here with my <laughs> with my cup of tea yeah. and we're sitting in these very plush yeah. couches on the beautiful right. Shalom Hartman campus. Um, and I feel I feel like a bit of a hypocrite talking about mm. being a you know, breaking the status quo, being an animal screaming in the night. So I'm curious if that if that dissonance uh, if that if that cognitive dissonance sits with you at all and, and how and how you reconcile the, the, the scholar and the demand of Reb Nachman. Uh, and maybe we'll start with that question. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, I think hypocrisy was one of the Hasidic uh, understanding. There's a very beautiful story that I like, uh, talking about one of the, you know, the um, Admorim, the rabbis of the Hasidut, and he's saying that he was sitting in his room and he was hearing, you know, people came to see the rabbi to ask his advice and to ask. So he's sitting in his room and he's, he hears... Uh, uh, behind the door, people are scratching the, the door and he is thinking to myself, oh, I'm so important. So many people came to see me. Wow. And then he opens the, the door and see the cat, actually. So this kind of story is a fantastic story, actually, to say that Hasid Hasidism actually was about trying to be very honest with yourself. You know, try not to fool yourself with all the things that we are falling into. Uh, trying to uh, get money, respect, uh, acknowledgement, whatever, you know, and to be very uh, careful, attuned, and listening careful, carefully to your inner motivation. I think this is something very important about Hasidism, the inner motivation to be aware and to speak about it, you know. Um, Ga'ava, the, the pride that we all looking, uh, you know, just be very attuned. Maybe you think you are humble, but thinking about yourself as a humble might be part of your pride. And this kind of, of thinking about, uh, so you're asking my about myself. Yes, I'm a little bit bourgeois, <laughs> it's true. I'm not living in a tent. But I think that I'm trying in my life not to be a uh, conformist in its, uh, maybe in its uh, lower uh, stage and to challenge, uh, to challenge myself uh, in my uh, inclination into bourgeois uh, life. Um, yeah, I think it has to, to do something with, uh, if, you, if you adapt this kind of life, not to uh, feel very comfortable with, with where you are. I'm not saying that I'm very successful in that, but I think it needs to be. It needs to be in your life that uh, you have to challenge yourself and your comfortable zones and your inner motivations. This is the psychoanalysis side of me uh, that I'm very attached to Hasidut because of this. Uh, where are we in our inner life, you know? Um, and it has to, and it also resonates 
the divine for 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 the Hasidim because because there's also inner life of, of God there's not not just the uh, the external action of God described in in you know in the Bible but there's for the Kabbalist and mystical tradition there's the inner side of God uh, Hasidic uh, writing came with a beautiful expression of Kadmut HaSechel which can be you know the the um, the unconscious we might translate it's something that actually drives you but you're not aware to it and you know it's a many many years before Freud mm. uh, so it's very interesting this kind of um, dealing with the inner motivation in a very profound way that I don't know before that in the Jewish tradition um, Hmm. Did I, did I no, it's fa it? yeah, it is. It's fascinating to explore this tension uh, between approaching these texts as a scholar, where we strive for some sort of you know critical eye and, and objectivity as far as we can, um, but then also feeling genuinely challenged. And it seems to me that both you and and, your, and many of your colleagues here are are in that very rich space between scholarship and between a real. A real commitment, an existential commitment, and it's not just an intellectual hobby. It's not just trivia. It's not just trying to figure out which manuscript was read by which philosopher. We're also interested in that. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, but I'm. I, I think it's there's a very beautiful mix here where the sometimes, and you know this perhaps better than many, the way that Rabbi Nachman or any other spiritual character from history who demanded real degrees of honesty and authenticity and self questioning, they're taken up in some very loose new age hippie easy forms of spirituality that aren't critical and aren't demanding and don't question ourselves don't question our lifestyles um and i'm wondering if if the sort of the critical eye of the scholar um you feel may be actually beneficial in your own spiritual engagement with those texts Yes, I think that uh, you know my own. I would say uh, infrastructure of my <laughs> of my myself is a kind of a critical too, um, and I think I won't be um, I won't be it won't be enough for me to um, to look in a very simplistic way on this text. And I think what you actually describe people taking it to many many shallow I would say places has to do a lot with what Rabbi Nachman is saying himself about being uncritical and be in in telling don't read you know hmm. philosophy um but i think maybe he's right maybe we shouldn't read religion in a philosophical eyes maybe it's something has has to do more with the different dimensions and maybe it fools us if we take philosophy as the only tool hmm to examine religious uh, experiences mm. so i think he's he's aware he's aware of that let me tell you about something that i love about rob nachman it's, also challenging me you're saying that his own anti-philosophical bend may lead to some of yeah, the yeah and it, that it does actually I, I have Best to thing. admit it it does Best it does thing. in what we see around <coughs> uh, rob nachman has a very i love this kind of story uh, about his life is actually saying that Rav Nathan, his his disciple and the one who actually put uh, his his um, his master on on, on text uh, publishing his uh, writing, Rav Nathan saying that uh, Rav Nachman was dealing with one of the biggest question in philosophy ever. I mean, in all the religion, you know, philosophy in all religion, the the question about God's omniscience. And from the one one side, and and the free will of the human being, right. and this, this uh, classic theological classic quandary. Theological God knows everything. Question. How do we have free choice? Yeah, how do we have a choice if everything He knows? And, and do we have a free choice? And this is a, a, a big question that actually, you know, it's in in all the three monotheistic questions, uh, you can find it, and people are thinking about it. And, and Maimonides wrote, uh, and he wrote something that God knows not the way we know that, therefore it can happen. And Raived there, one of the disciples saying, it's not good that, that Maimonides opened this question because it's a tricky one, mm. might can fall on this question. So Rab Nachman knows all of this because he, he's, he himself reads a lot he's, of Maimonides. He's not unaware, right? <laughs> Although he's yeah. telling his reader not to read it. And he's saying the following story. He said, Rab Nachman had, a, had an answer 
to this kind of a question, and he wrote it on a piece of paper. He wrote a note with the answer uh, to this question, but he lost hmm. the piece of note. This is the story <laughs> that he tells. And he says, it's good that he lost the note. And Rav Nachman is actually saying that forgetting things is very good. Mm. People usually think that forgetting things is uh, not a good thing. Of course, to remember and to know, this is the ideal. But Rav Nachman thinks that to forget things, it's very good. And now we come up with the, the idea that actually we spoke about in many angles in this discussion with you, in this conversation, that you need to create yourself. It's an ongoing process. He had an answer to that certain day, 1779, you know, in, a, I don't know where, a, let's say, Norwich or, or Uman. He had this kind of answer to himself. He forgot it, but now he needs to create a new answer. I think it's very interesting because we know also psychological research see, shows us that every stage in life, people are thinking about God in a different way. Mm -hmm. It's not the, the way that a four years old and a 15 years old and a 30 years old think about God in different ways. And therefore you need to create something. So an answer, uh, you will give an answer, you know, Maimonides gave an answer. How does it, how does it resonate in me? I need to create my own answer to that. In uh, the chidush that I will come up, the answer, my own innovation will create the, the next stage that I will need to stand on for next day. So I thought it was, uh, you know, wow. Um, Eye-opening to say, you know, in, in a tradition that, you know, based itself on learning and learning mm. and remembering to say, it's good that sometimes mm. to, to forget. And in another time, Rabbi Nachman says, you know, sleeping is a great thing. Um, you have to forgive me. I, I asked too many personal questions. But um, I love this, this last idea that you brought up that the answer is never enough. And if we have the answer, we're actually static and we're, we're stale. We're stuck. And in some sense, the question um, is more rich than the answer because questions always demand more and we need new answers in every day in every generation um, and from what you hear it's Rabbi Nachman giving he gave his answer and throughout his lifetime gave many answers um, <clears throat> it's a really beautiful idea it reminds me of a, a story told of a character sometimes compared with Rabbi Nachman which is Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Kotsk the Kotsk Rabbi who was also notorious in his quest for truth um, following the, you know the Talmudic adage that the seal of God is truth and they say that he didn't write anything down himself like many great religious characters and geniuses but he he kept sort of one little notepad one one paper and and he kept sort of refining that one paper and coming to like one truth proposition that he could come to and crossing it out and rewriting it is it that what we do in our life trying to go back <laughs> to the same sentence and to refine it again and again they call it the, the palimpsest this piece of paper that's been erased a thousand times right that we, we do it and they say in the end that uh, he instructed his disciples to bury him with the paper because even that truth that he refined over years and years and years of, of deep in soul searching uh, was only the truth for him for that moment and he didn't want it to become a gospel for you know it's, it's be the truth the answer for the future so on this theme of questions um, allow me to ask a personal question which is that you're speaking of your own engagement with Rabbi Nachman and with Jewish texts and ideas and thinkers more broadly speaking and you have a very rich engagement in that and it's a beautiful thing to, to encounter is there one question that that has been bothering you or irking you through the years the 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 skeptic the cr the critic inside of of Bitti's mind mm. is there is there one question that's 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 well, undermining there you <laughs> <laughs> there are many you know i i would say that there's a third generation to holocaust survivor from auschwitz my grandfather um this is a question that bothered me um, evil in life, mm. yeah. So, um, 
I don't, I don't, I don't see life as you know. Um, how do you say? A, 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 you know, a caspomat. That's something you put to, to, to an take ATM. money, ATM kind mm-hmm. of machine. That God has to do what you want. I, I'm not looking at, at my relationship to God like this. But um, and I do, I, I do to myself thinking about God as somebody who who do gives us a free will. Otherwise, it won't be meaningful to be here and that he actually stepped back and we can create evil world mm. or, or the best world. Nevertheless, it bothers me. Mm. It bothers me. Uh, do a father that see two sons uh, um, fighting each other? Should, should not, should uh, separate them from doing so. So I'm... I'm, I'm I'm with this question, um, and I think it's a, it's a challenging. I would say that in one, you know, on one side is, is Job. This is the question of Job. On the other side, Kohelet, as mm-hmm. you say, Ecclesiastes. Yes, this Ecclesiastes. is Ecclesiastes. <laughs> uh, he is also bothered by a very big question about the meaningful. Is there is there meaningful mm. uh, to this world? Is there meaning? Uh, or maybe everything is for vain. So it's also a question that mm. that, that goes with me. And um, you know, Rab Nachman is uh, described as somebody that uh, once uh, his old disciples came to him. You know, people came. It wasn't an airplane, and <laughs> not the bus, and not the taxi. They they came up, leaving their you know their uh, career. I would say yes, their panasa, mm. their family coming to see him. Mm. And he said, I don't know. Why did you come to me? Mm. I have nothing to tell you. Mm. There's nothing that I know. Mm. And Rav Natan, his disciple, says from this situation of him saying, I don't know, came a big um, Torah, a big Chidush, a big... Uh, insight. A big insight. A big, a big insight. So it's a, it's a little bit to know that, uh, like Socrates is saying, you know, this, the wise knows that he doesn't know. You need to... Lishot, you need to presence in this kind of situation, and it's a it's a part of a the journey of life. Mm. And it's it's striking that you know a rabbi, a master mm. that's supposed to lead his disciples to know everything, mm. he is saying to them, actually educating them. I don't know. Mm. It's a very fascinating model, and I think about our current spiritual leadership in various traditions, our own rabbinic leadership, and how much of it is these faces of of assurance and uh, authority and knowledge and absolute answers versus someone like Rabbi Nachman who's, who says, I, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really radical model to, to exemplify. Can you tell us about Rabbi Nachman, the storyteller, and yeah. how those themes are making his way into his really incredible, elaborate stories and, and, and why they're so... Like shocking and revolutionary in in his religious literary context, right? So first of all, I would say it's it's an innovation style or or um, genre in in the Hasidic uh, writing because usually stories that been told in this uh, area was about uh, admiring the tzaddik, admiring the master. He was that from very early stage. He could read everything and he could remember everything, and he was so. Uh, full of good deeds and everything. These hagiographies of saints. Hagiographies. Yeah. This is say uh, what we find a lot mm. in the Hasidic writing. But here comes Rab Nachman. First of all, as I said, he writes about himself as as an anti-hero. Mm. But to leave this aside, he is developing a kind of um, poetic uh, writing, which will be like science fiction, fantasy, uh, that actually he he tells that and he admits that he takes from all over. A European style mm. of storytelling, and um, it's a conglomerate. He's putting it inside. He he makes it a kind of a text uh, that needs to do something. Four years before he died, he, he died in a very early stage. He was thirty-eight. You know, like Luzzato and Luria, they all came not to the age of forty. Mm. Um, so four years before he he died, he said. It's not enough what I have been telling you all these years. Nothing is really happening. 
Uh, your heart is still a stone. Mm. He wasn't and affecting the change he was hoping to see. Yeah, but maybe he wanted to tease them mm. or maybe he was really um, uh, frustrated with mm. them. But nevertheless, he says, sometimes he says, you're a feather, like in my collar, maybe they came to admire him and he said, okay, <laughs> move around. Mm. Um, but he says, four years before this, let me tell you now, stories mm. and as I said from stories you might awake somebody that is sleeping in a very deep sleep mm. his understanding that the style of art poetic might be much more meaningful and awakening than uh, homilies is very interesting and has also to understand his his uh, his insight about psyche the psyche of the of the believer and to say sometimes if you say something very direct you give a verse from the from the bible you bring a text from the talmud people are closing their closing their minds mm. it's it's they know that somebody now is coming to give them mm. to give them a to tell them something that they're not good uh, rebuke. Uh, rebuke them right. But if you tell them a story about a princess, a beautiful princess, and you know, and a king, and a snake, and a mountain of jewelry, so wow, everyone is fascinating. We all love stories. Mm. We get into the stories. Most of the stories of Rav Nachman are not ended. It's not they lived happily ever after. Mm. It's he he cuts it in the in the end. So the reader of the, I must say, the listener is going with the story, trying to make sense of the story, makes him to be immersed in, in the experience of the story and to question it and to think about it. So let's take the, you know, the first very famous the legend of Rob Nachman about the, the little princess. She's a, she's a sister of six brothers and the king loves her most and he plays with her and amused together and they have great fun. And I don't know what happened. Maybe she, she, uh, she, uh, she stepped on his feet or he says a curse mm. and she's going to her room crying and the day after they didn't find her. Mm. And then starts a story of a few pages, let's say about 20 pages, about the way this king is trying to find um, his, his daughter. Mm. And it goes always around. At the end it says he did find her, but the way he actually released her, uh, she was locked on a, on a castle. He didn't say. So this mm. is a story that I just said. In a, you can you can summarize it in three sentences. But the story is a very long story, and you get into it and you ask yourself, who is the little princess? Is this me? Is this the soul? Is this the anima? Is this the people of Israel? Is this a shechina, the divine woman, in the Kabbalah? And it works on you. It's like it, you think about it and. Is this the lost soul that I have to get myself back to the king, which is the Lord, which is God? Is so in this way he wanted to create a kind of of a um, temptation to to his disciples to go inside their inner, you know, motivation, life, a feeling of their lost, of their alienation from God, of the far, being far away from God, and to create a kind of a move to motivate them to move, to bring back mm -hmm. the little princess back to her uh, origin or God or her lover or her father, whatever you would say. So I think this kind of understanding poetic, uh, we can see it also in his writing, which is full with associations a associative way of thinking and poetry style is he's, he's a genius in that mm. so there's something powerful about the story you're saying where <clears throat> firstly it catches us off guard right where we know when we're about to get a lecture and we shut our ears off exactly. and the story we uh, has the capacity to slip beneath our guard doors i think we can see it you know all over i think the old world of, of uh, advertisement mm. is, is mm. on this on the images right on, yeah. right
the, these these unconscious associations, uh, and then and then there's also the capacity where in the story we can begin to identify with the character, and we can feel like we're part of the story. We can feel like we're concerned with the outcome, and and he leaves the endings you're saying exactly. sort of cut off, broken, ambiguous. Um, and there's a sense perhaps of an incompleteness that we ourselves have to partake in, in completing, um, which is which is no different really. Rabbi Nachman is perhaps the first Hasidic author to use these epic stories in his way of trying to wake up the people from their spiritual slumber. But in, in reality, the Bible right, is also a book of stories that in some ways are conveying these truths that we're unpacking for thousands of years to come. Um, so there's something, there is something organic. And, and the Midrash Shim, I mean, there, there is and a long tradition. Also in the Zohar, there's right. a lot of stories. But, but the tune is different. Mm. Like the tune of, of the Bible and the Talmud and some of the stories that we know is a very um, educating. Mm. It's a Musa, it gives you, no, 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 you're not good enough. You sinned and you... These kind of stories are different. They mm. sit on a different, they sit on the images. As Rabbi Nachman said, it's a sipuri mishanim kadmoniot. He says it's a story from, from, from the primordial times. Mm. You know, it's like an archetype, mm. Jungian archetype. It's the soul, it's the anima, it's the old person, it's the, the baby. It's like, and you get yourself into this kind of a very, very deep and, and profound way of thinking about mm yourself in all these kind of images mm. and um, in the describing a kind of um, massaf of, of a voyage, you know, that you have to take in life. It's, and you understand that it, uh, it actually works on a very deep level. Mm. Who might you compare Reb Nachman to in this aspect of his, his storytelling style and his, in his authorship? Who, does anyone come to mind? He's unique. Hmm. <laughs> I know there's 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 a story that uh, actually we can base historically hmm. that uh, while Buber came um, came uh, to Europe to speak about Rav Nachman, uh, Kafka hmm. or one of his friends sat there in Buber's uh, telling about uh, Rav Nachman's uh, stories. So, for example, a story about um, how do you say Lifne Achok before the law. Before the law right. Which, which talks about a person that sits the whole day wanting to get into a castle or to mm -hmm. meet somebody. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, you're not, you're not, you're, it's not clear why he's not doing it, but he's not doing it. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the guide of the place said, we, it was for you. Mm -hmm. Like, we waited for you. Mm -hmm. So this kind of story we can, uh, we can see in, in some of the stories that Rabbi Nachman mm -hmm. told. Rabbi Nachman wrote, Tons of stories, uh, some something like hundred stories, wow. were collected lately by Tzvi Mark. But this kind of story we can find in many of the stories of Rabbi Nachman about somebody that needs to do something and he's not doing it, yeah. and actually he missed it, but it was for him. Mm. You know, this kind mm. of understanding. So, I think maybe Kafka very different, but maybe Kafka, but mm. is unique. Is Was Kafka reading Rabbi Nachman? Is there so any possibility of that? Uh, uh, the only fact that we know that Kafka or his friends uh, <coughs> were were exposed to the lectures that Martin Buber mm. uh, gave in in Europe, uh, that he might you know be inspired by, mm. by it. Mm. Um, yes, but he is he is unique. Mm. He is unique, and um, some of the you know the. Um, the Hebrew um, new poets and the uh, writers in, in Israel um, describe him as the, the first one. One mm. say he was he was lunatic and he was crazy and you know this kind of mm. people that came from the Enlightenment and rational side of Jewish that couldn't bear this mm. kind of treating Jewish life in mm. a kind of a fantasy for mm. kids mm. or with dreams. Mm. Uh, but Sam actually appreciated that there's a kind of a treasure. In mm. his uh, in his uh, poetic writing, mm. I want to just draw. I can't, I don't want to keep you for too much longer. You've been very generous with your time. I don't. We we throw our watches away when we sit down, so we don't know what time it is. But um, yeah, what time is it? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> We've only really touched on um, one swath of your research and your scholarship and your your immense knowledge, and and we're very grateful for you sharing it with us and. For, for the time that you put in, the, the hours and hours that you put in 
going through these texts and sitting with them and exploring them and questioning them. Um, it's a real gift that you did that. And, and now we're able to be your neck. We're able to, to suckle on some of that wisdom. There's a whole, there are many other sides of your scholarship. We didn't mention, you know, the, the Kabbalists of Tzfat, the 16th century Renaissance of Jewish mysticism. But um, another area which you're quite well known for is your work on the Zohar, and specifically on the Tikkun Zohar, the last strata, the latest strata of the, of the Zohar. Maybe just as a, as a final segue to, to whet the listener's appetite for perhaps a, another round or to dig into your own published scholarship, what was the relationship between Rabbi Nachman and the Tikkun Zohar? How did those themes um, that are in there some themes of the divine feminine and other themes that you explore. How did they make their way to connect your two loves here, if we can, if we can put it yeah, that way? Definitely. Actually, historically speaking, you know, biography speaking, I started with Rab Nachman and I said, there's a lot of Kabbalistical ideas here. I need to go back. And then I went to study Zohar. And I was very impressed and inspired by this kind of uh, latest strata of the Zohar, which is in the 14th century, probably, uh, again, in, in the Iberian a place, Spain, um, Tikkun Zohar, which actually uh, is an unbelievable writing. Actually, the book, the main book of this kind of uh, books uh, called Tikkun Zohar, the frame of the book is to give 70 homilies to the word, the only word, and the first word in the Bible, Bereshit, hmm. to say that every word in the Bible uh, needs to get this kind of treatment. <laughs> By the way, Ramchal, Rabbi Chaim Lutzato, takes this kind of, uh, take this idea and do it, does it for the last uh, words of the Bible. Mm. But there's, there's a very um, uh, um, profound idea here of the Jewish tradition that the Jewish tradition is not about dogma, but rather about exegesis and giving commentaries and seeing and and you know, the, the idea of deconstruction, deconstruction of, of the letters and, and the language is embodied here, not just in the 20th century, but here to say that every word can be separated and every word is a, is, is a kind of a, an infinite a, ideas that you can put into it. I think it's very crucial to understand the Jewish tradition. Nevertheless, a, this Kabbalist that we don't know, he's an anonymous, we don't know his name, is, um, is coming up with a kind of, uh, I would say, you know, of, of a stream of, of, of consciousness. consciousness. Yeah. He starts with one word and he's way, blah, blah, blah. He's going up with his ideas, um, interwaving them idea to idea to idea. He can start with a, a word in the Bible, go to a kind of a midrash, making a numerical understanding, putting the word into two pieces. This for me was a kind of, first it was a riddle to understand what he's saying, because it was for me, like you say, Greek, nachon, yeah. say, what is it doing here? So it was very um, inspiring. And second of all, to understand the way he thinks and to understand his kind of creativity blow my mind. Then I said to myself, what's his idea? Because as I told you, I'm a daughter, I'm a daughter of a psychoanalyst. And the, the scholars of the Kabbalah, Gershom Shalom and Ishayahu Tishbi, said this Kabbalist is wandering from a idea to idea. He's not systematical. He's just going with wherever he wants to my understanding psychologically this is cannot be the truth mm -hmm. if you have a stream of thought you have an idea that you want to say or something that leads you mm -hmm. so then i went to to try to discover what is interest what what his his real interest is what's his thesis what is thesis yeah. what is all these ideas are coming on what he wants to say and i came up with the idea that he's very interested in the divine feminine aspect, which we call it, we call it in, the, in the Kabbalah, the Shekhinah, which is a very uh, womanly uh, God, which I was very, um, it was very striking to see. And he actually say, let's worship her. Hmm. Like God, he is the father, he brings the law, he is the transcendent, he is the perfect, and she actually carries 
all the 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 defects mm. of this world mm. of the divine if one might say it for example she describes as somebody that a uh, cannot walk she the Shekhinah, this she goddess. The Shekhinah. and mm. based on on the Amos you know verses about the Shekhinah, that she's falling to the mm. dust and she cannot stand mm. up and the she's going with the people of Israel to mm. the exile she is the lover of God mm. but nevertheless she is with the people of Israel mm. so mm. I wrote a, an article that people actually said wow 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 what is it you know the divine the divine creep right. right. how can I say it you know <laughs> And it's very interesting that the woman, the feminine, actually carries all the imperfect of, of God. Mm. And she's actually identified with the history itself, which has ups and downs, and the Jews had a lot of downs. Mm. And she is she's described as the secret of, of the possible. Mm. Like he is, you know, he is the perfect and what needs to be. Mm. The actual. The actual one, not just the actual, but the mechuyava metziut. This is what needs to be. But she actually carries... Or the possibility of mm. the divine, mm. which uh, was a striking idea to understand that this kind of Kabbalist doesn't describe God just as perfect, mm. you know, in a philosophical way, that if he wants something, it's an, it's, an, it's an obstacle, it's a defect, but rather that he's involved in the history, uh, sometimes they call they call the Shechina, in the she's word, involved in she history. is involved <laughs> in the history, and they call her Ani, Ani's mm. I. Mm. So she is the. Why are the they F, calling her I? It's, because it's the identification. It's she's here. She's mm. present. Mm. She's first present. Mm. He is the who. He is right. the there. Transcendent. He's the, right. the third third right. person you right. say in English, right? But she is here. That's, that's the literal. The, the etymology of Shekhinah is the Shochen. Shochen. Yeah, she's dwells, right. here. She's she dwells here. She's with us, and their their sensibility. I mean, their ability to describe feminine in the Kabbalah, in the Zohar, uh, and the aspects of the feminine, the daughter and the mother and the mother and the lover and, uh, you know, the womb and giving birth. That, uh, my friend Ruth Kara spo- wrote, wrote a whole book about it and, and about the, the maternity and about uh, feeding and all these kind of aspects and, and functions are striking. Mm. Some people thought this is, might be the... the um, Maybe this the thesis that somebody a woman wrote the mm. Zohar. Yeah. I don't think it's it's true, but nevertheless, it's trying the ability to be so sensible and to describe the feminine to understand how how giving birth and how being in love is all crucial to this world eh, to, and to describe the divine as as this. So um, yeah, this is was uh, one of my. Uh, discovery about this uh, this book and uh, and other also and also i found a description of her putting on tefillin you mm. know which considered to be a very masculine ritual mm. um describing her as the hevel you know the hevel is the 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 breath, air, the breath that comes mm. from your mouth mm. the fluidity of the divine right. the possibilities uh, of the divine uh, the history, the downside, the mm. defects, mm. all this uh, very striking in this, uh, in this uh, book. And uh, this book had a very tremendous influence on the, myst- on the Jewish mysticism mm. later on. It was published before the Zohar mm. even and in many, many, you know, editions and it, it influenced you know Hasidut and it influenced Rabbi Nachman also the, the ideas and also the style of writing mm. associative and this kind of very tense and dense uh, writing and the Gaon of Vilna wrote a commentary to it and, and Ramchal as I mentioned mm. and you know Rav Kook and it, it was all a very very um, I mean scholarly it was abandoned a little bit to the Zohar mm. Oh, it's not a, it's not a systematic, it's not a, you know, the Zohar has its own theology, mm. a kind of, there's a story, and this kind of was too dense, but actually mm. it's, it reminds a lot from the Hasidic writing, which is a very, you know, short idea, and you go with a associative way of thinking, and, um, 
it's striking to see the influential aspect yeah. of, of this. So you're saying while it was ignored. Scholarly. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> while, it was, while it was a little bit neglected in, in scholarly analysis. In the beginning of the scholarly, right. Zoharic <laughs> right. Undertaking field. that project. Um, but for the Hasidic world, it was very influential. Um, so I, I mean, I know myself reading Chabad Hasidot, it's, it's quoted all the time, probably more than other strata um, of the Zohar. The, um, for example, the idea of, of you know, uh, that you probably saw it in Chabad, let atar panoi mm. there's no mm. void place from mm. God. It's not a Zoharic, it's from Tikkuni Zohar. Mm. Tikkuni Zohar has this kind of emanation, meaning the divine described as something that comes from a stage to a stage, mm. gradually, gradually mm. to this to this place. Right. But Tikkun Ezra has this kind of different theology, which is imminent. Mm. God presents new. If you know Patach Eliyahu, it's a very well-known text from mm -hmm. Tikkun Ezra. Another, another aspect of Tikkun Ezra, so influential, right. this text went into the liturgy. Right. Patach Eliyahu. Right. Describe God as a water that that watering the tree, the tree mm. of life and, and the world, which is more imminent. God is here, mm. God presence here, mm. and he's within even within you. Or she. Or yeah. she. <laughs> oh yeah, or she. Uh, so this kind of for for example, this idea is is a tikune zohar. Or or to say, you know, Trilu Rimu, which is also kind of became a kind of a phrase for mm -hmm. liturgy. Mm -hmm. I'm doing this uh, this act in 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 the sake of unifying God, the masculine and mm -hmm. the divine, with Trilu Urchimu, with love and fear, is a tikkun mm -hmm. expression mm -hmm. to say again, you need to do things with fear and love. It's not enough to do it. And as Tikkun Ezra was saying, it's like a bird that cannot uplift to the air if one of the wings mm. is 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 missing. Mm. Is Tikkun Ezra um, to speak about the tefillah uh, in this kind of uh, hierarchy, even more than than studying Torah, mm. is also Tikkun Ezra yeah. speaking about revelation and hidgalut is uh, is very common in Tikkun Ezra. So there's a, there's a lot of things that actually came from Tikkun Ezra and also scholars and, and traditional writing see the Zohar and Tikkun Ezra together, but they are not. <laughs> that was a really brilliant survey of some of the key themes that are making their way from the Tikkun Ezra into contemporary uh, or modern, let's say, Hasidic theology and, and life. What are the perhaps particular themes that Rabbi Nachman specifically um, is picking up from I'm sure. I'm sure he's employing all of these to some extent. But is, is there any really core central themes that he's connecting with and and um, continuing and innovating on? Um, I need to think about it. But um, you know, it's common to say, and I, I I believe in that, scholarly speaking, that the difference between Kabbalah, uh, Middle Ages, uh, Kabbalah, let's say the Zohar. And Hasidut in the 18th century is that Hasidut took Kabbalah and we, we call it psychologization of the Kabbalah. Or as Martin Buber said, uh, um, making mysticism into ethos. Uh, or one of, I think one of the Chabad Admorim is describing it, taking the, the, the diamond of Kabbalah, graining it, grinding it, grinding it right. into powder P powder and feeding the the mass right. so this kind of taking the very you know um complicated idea and feeding the mass which need to be something the, the masses the masses mm. that needs to be with something very short mm. and very clear and very um very close to one's one's way of living uh, let like we said before there's no void of God or or trilu chimu love and fear all these kind of ideas um, were found their, their way into this uh, you know I wrote an article about this the story that we spoke about the lost princess and I actually show show that Rab Nachman took it from a uh, one piece from Tikkun mm. writing about the mitzvah the commandment of lost and found mm. 
that you need to, um, actually in, inside Tikkuni Azor, there's a, there's a section that speaks about the commandments, giving a mystical explanation mm. to each commandment, mm. uh, which is fascinating. I, I love this kind of uh, mystical writing about commandments and ritual because it looks so technique, mm. and then you come up with a mystical ideas. It's like crazy. Yeah, so, so he speaks about, Tikkun Ezra speaks about lost and found, this kind of commandment that you need to bring back if you found something that is not yours. And he gives a mystical explanation to it, like he does to all the commandments. And he says that the lost is the princess. Mm. And I could see that the text that actually inspired Dov Nachman was this text that the lost is the princess. That you need to bring it back to yourself and you need to bring it back to the king. And so... You know, Rabbi Nachman was very creative. He saw the Tikkun Ezoar. He says the Tikkun Ezoar is, is above the Zohar. And he, he, he spoke, admired the Tikkun Ezoar. And, and I can, could prove that, you know, this is a kind of a mystical explanation to this commandment, made him write it, change it into a poetic, you know. It's, it's a fascinating idea that, that the, the lost object is the soul or is the, the divine object, yeah. feminine that we have to return. And, and then it comes up with an amazing idea that you go in Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, you know, the, the beginning of the year, which is a, a day of awe and a day of, of confession and guilt. And, you know, you need to make a cheshbon nefesh and to think what happened in your life, blah, blah, blah. Actually change into this kind of idea that actually one's go every beginning of the year and what he needs to think is what did he lost this year mm. that he needs to bring back mm. and blowing the shofar this is Rab Nachman told one of the Torah uh, one of the writing that blowing the shofar is actually when you <laughs> it's announcement that you found now what you lost and he said also the master also the tzaddik is is losing because it says in in Kohelet yes there's a time to lose and there's a time to find. So actually life is a kind of a cycle of lost and found. Uh, so this kind of uh, way of treating, you know, the ideas, it's very interesting because what we saw that there is a myth sitting on, on, the, ex on the commentary of Tikkun Ezoar to speak about you know, the princess is the Shrina, is the divine feminine, and it's the soul. Bringing it in, into a commandment homily, and then Rabbi Nachman brings it back to a kind of a mythical way, telling a story about it, taking all kinds of, of commandment clues, but giving us the pure story of it. So it's a kind of a nice, you know, round going back and round, in what way can I persuade you to do some change in your life and to go and find something that you lost or deny or abandoned or didn't take care of enough? I have the feeling like we could go on for many hours and uh, some people, the more that you talk with them, they sort of get tired and they kind of, their energy droops off and uh, with you, I feel it's just the opposite. I feel like your energy is just uh, beginning to beginning to get. St <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I feel like it also might might rain on us soon, um, and I, I do want to be conscious of your time and let you go back home to your to your to your ha to your house and your family, uh, whoever's waiting for you. Um, but I would just like to say thank you so very much for sitting with us and for sharing with us so openly and so authentically. Um, and it's hard to say because you know we can't read the mind. Of Rabbi Nachman, but I think Rabbi Nachman would be very proud with with a conversation like this. That's that's rigorous and thoughtful and challenging, um, and trying to bring his ideas to a wider audience. Um, and like, I'd like to thank you both for your work throughout your career, doing that work, and the small sliver of it now of sharing with us, uh, with our audience here, with this collaboration thank with you, Sheldon Hartman and Seekers of Unity. Thank you, Zevik. It was a pleasure talking to you. It's so special. And it was a, a pleasure. And I thank you for this opportunity. My pleasure. Wonderful. I, I really feel like we're just getting started. <laughs> it's true, you know, it's my style.